Okay. I want to welcome everybody and thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Carrie Hulak. I'm the editor of Richmond Side. This is the first of a series of three Richmond City Council candidate forums. And if you're new to us, Richmond Side is a Richmond-focused news website based right here at COVID's. We launched three months ago. Bienvenidos, hola a todos. Soy Perry Hula, directora de Richmond Side. Muchas gracias por unirse al primero de una serie de tres foros de candidatos al Ayuntamiento de Richmond. Richmond Side es un sitio web de noticias centrado en Richmond, con sede aquí mismo, en COVIDs, cuyo lanzamiento fue hace tres meses atrás. And our first order of business is to welcome tonight's interpreters. Please give a warm welcome to Lana Miller and Keira Lugo Rania. They're going to explain uh, how the interpretation works. Nuestra primer orden del día es presentar a nuestras intérpretes. Por favor, den una cálida bienvenida a Keila Lugo Ranial y Latna Miller que explicarán un poco cómo funciona la interpretación. Hola, yo soy Keila y estoy aquí con Latna y hoy seremos sus intérpretes entre inglés y español. Hello, I am Keila and I am here with Latna and today, tonight, we will be your interpreters between English and Spanish. Richmond Side, UC Berlin's, Berlin's Richmond Confidential, El Tiparo y Contra Costa Pearls están comprometidos con crear espacios, con la justicia del lenguaje y con crear espacios multilingües porque sabemos que nuestros eventos son más democráticos y poderosos cuando son multilingües. Richmond Side, UC Berkeley's Richmond Confidential, El Tímpano y Contra Costa Pearls are committed to language justice and to creating multilingual spaces because they know our movements are more democratic and more powerful when they are multilingual. Wait, powerful. When they are multilingual. Thank you. Hoy tendremos interpretación hacia el español de manera simultánea y hacia el inglés de manera consecutiva. Si desea oír el evento en español, por favor, pase por la entrada a buscar un dispositivo de interpretación. Tonight we will have a simultaneous interpretation into Spanish and consecutive interpretation into English. If you prefer to listen to the event in Spanish, please go and pick up a device near the entrance. And El crear espacios, well, I'm going to now go into simultaneous and in, in English, and she, um, that, that will be doing into Spanish simultaneous. And here we go. Creating multilingual spaces is not only the responsibility of the interpreters, but of everyone here. That's why we'll be sharing some guidelines so you can help us out. Spanish is 30% longer than English. As such, it takes longer to say things in Spanish. We interpreters are constantly competing with our own voices while we interpret, even if we're whispering. It is harder to hear than you think. As such, everyone can help us by speaking at a moderate pace, loudly and clearly. If we need you to speak more slowly, we'll make this signal. If you see us do it, please do it with us so that the speaker can see us. This is a collective effort, everyone. I'm waiting. Okay, good, thank you. If we need you to speak louder or closer to the microphone, we will do this. And what will you do? Thank you, like in a concert. Everyone with us if you see it, do it. And we can only interpret one voice at a time. We've tried interpreting more, but one voice at a time. So if more than one person is speaking at a time, we'll just remind you by doing this. You can remember this if you wish, but just do this with us, please. Let's practice. Okay, thank you so much. Speak one person at a time. Please wait two to three seconds when you change speakers so that we can catch up with what people have said. And lastly, please don't suffer in silence. If you're having trouble with the interpretation, let the interpreter who's not interpreting at that time know, and we'll be glad to help. Thank you, and enjoy your event. 
Gladwin, Kayla, we appreciate you being here. Now I'd like to introduce the other newsrooms co-hosting our three Meet the Candidate forums. In addition to Richmond side, our forums are co-hosted by UC Berkeley's Richmond Confidential, El Pimpano, and the Contra Costa Pulse. We thank them and events director Becky Couch Alvarado, our timekeeper for tonight, for their work organizing these forums. Here's how tonight will work. Each candidate will get two minutes to introduce themselves. Our moderator, Christine Siapo, will then present some questions that were submitted by Richmond residents and compiled by journalists from the participating sponsors. Each candidate will have the opportunity to respond. Responses are limited to three minutes. We'll then open it up to questions from the audience. You see the cards around your chairs. You can jot a question down there and pass it in, or you can take the mic to ask a question if you'd like. Uh, if you're on Zoom, you can put your question in the chat, and our volunteers will write it down, and Christine will ask it. Finally, we'll close out the evening by giving the candidates a minute each to give any closing remarks that they wish to. I'd like to remind everyone to silence your phones. Are there any questions about the process? All right, fantastic. So I'd like to most importantly introduce and welcome our candidates. Please welcome Dr. Jamila Brown, Mark Wasberg, and District 1 Council Member Melvin Willen. Thank you so much for being here. And I'm gonna turn it over to our moderator, Christine. Thanks, Carrie. Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm the editor of Richmond Confidential. And before we begin, we're asking everyone, the candidates as well as the audience, to please respect each other's time and not interrupt each other. And we also ask that you follow the rules of civil discourse, keeping your tone non-confrontational and your language respectful. Um, and we're going to start by giving each candidate two minutes to introduce themselves. We're going in alphabetical order, which brings us first to Dr. Brown. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much. Uh, greetings, District 1, and if you're not District 1, welcome to District 1. And to, whoever, and to everyone who put this magnificent event uh, together this evening. My name is Dr. Jamila Brown, a proud fourth generation Richmond resident, born and raised right here in District 1. This community isn't just where I grew up. It's where I learned the value of hard work, resilience, and the power of neighbors supporting each other. I've walked these streets, I've attended these schools, and faced some of the same challenges you have. While I've earned my doctorate in social work and built a career helping those throughout California, my heart has always remained in District 1. I've seen too often how we've, how we've been overlooked and underserved, and I am running for city council to change that. I am not just here to represent. I'm here to fight, fight for the resources, the opportunities, and the attention that this district deserves. My vision is very simple, but powerful. Safer streets, greater engagement, more affordable housing, and a thriving local economy. I'm not a politician. I'm a mom, a friend, and a neighbor who's ready to ensure our community finally gets the investments it needs. Together, we can build a better District 1, one where we're heard and no one is left behind. Let's make sure our district gets the respect and the resources it deserves. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Brown. And now, Mr. Wasberg. Well, I'm Mark Wasberg. I grew up in San Pablo, went to Richmond High, spent all my working years in Richmond. First, I was a factory worker. I became an auto technician. Then I went to work at Chevron as a mechanic. Then I got involved with Andre Shoemake and all the other reverends here when the heyday of the violence between 2004 and 2010. 
It was all out there protesting Ted City, Operation Richmond, the Black Crime Summit. I was with all through these people for six years. And uh, I lived in so beer all my life. I used to cruise the main down here, down in McDonald Avenue. I don't, I don't, I don't think many people was here during that time. And uh, I lived in Point Richmond, and there's a lot of people asking me, what are you hanging around here for, Mark? I said, man, I ain't on a roll. I said, there's shootings and beatings and homicides everywhere. I'm not going anywhere. I mean, it was really bad during this time. Then I got involved in, uh, I made a documentary. I got involved in filmmaking going to school being a film editor. I host my own television show. I've got the flyer right on the, on the uh, table over there. I mean, uh, I like the politics. I like the air. The weather's great. And uh, I don't live far from here. You know, I mean, the reason why I, I hung around here is because of the job opportunities. And I mean, there was factories, jobs everywhere. I mean, I had a lot of friends here. And, uh, Richmond's going to be my home for a long time, and I'm mostly concerned about the high crime right here. This is why I've been fighting the city council. This is why I made a documentary to show you people what's really going on. I mean, actually, just right down the street here on Fourth and McDonald, probably about 95 percent of the homicides were there. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wasper. And now Council Member Willis. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining today and everybody who hosted this event this evening. Uh, my name's Melvin Willis. I was born and raised in Richmond. Grew up in a single parent household because my dad ended up passing away before I was born. Primarily grew up around the 23rd Street corridor for those of you that were around uh, late 90s, early 2000s, but Babs Dairy was a place my mom used to work at, and that's where I spent most of my time, including just walking up and down to get from point A to point B, like to the BART station. I first, my political engagement first started in 2011 when I joined a group called ACE, the Alliance of Californians for Community Empowerment. And that forced me to do door-to-door -door outreach to talk with folks about issues and concerns and solutions they wanted to work on in order to tackle those issues. That first thing led to us uh, advocating and fighting for a vacant property registration ordinance in 2012 that got passed through the Richmond City Council. When I first ran for City Council, I honestly had no in didn't think I was going to win. I was mainly fighting for rent control and just cause for eviction, which was the first rent control law to be passed in Richmond in over 30 years. And since then, I went on to joining the council, help increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour with a cost of living adjustment, supported uh, measures E and K, which was to take 3% of the general fund and put it towards youth programs and services. Uh, when Donald Trump was elected, we strengthened our sanctuary city ordinance by divesting from license plate readers that shared information with immigration custom and enforcement. And I was a part of many county efforts to end the contracts with ICE, actually, at the West County Jail. And this year, we actually fought for, uh, with one Contra Costa for health care for undocumented adults in Contra Costa County who couldn't qualify for anything else. And I'll talk about more when I have more time. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Willis. In our first round, I'm going to be asking you questions that were compiled by journalists from the four media outlets that we mentioned at the beginning. Um, and we just ask that you speak a little more slower, a little slower than you normally do for the interpreters, um, and that you keep your responses to no more than three minutes. Um, I think we'll start with Mr. Willis and we'll go back or down the line. And the first question is very simply, why should voters choose you? The next, okay, this is still on. I, I'll ultimately, I want voters to vote their conscience. If anything I say resonates with you, your values, and integrity, please vote for me. 
Otherwise, the argument that I can make for myself objectively without being biased towards myself is I've been an organizer in Richmond, Contra Costa County for the past 30 years, which has also led me to do organizing work at the state level. A, no, 30 years, 13 years, one three. <laughs> ACE um, does an annual lobby day, and I've always participated in those to also advocate for statewide policies. And a lot of the times they make me a lobby lead to help train new members or new staff members on agendas on what we're going to do as we're talking to legislators. A lot of the work that I've worked on statewide has been around housing. Even this year we were fighting for a constitutional amendment to make housing a human right in California's state constitution. And we also were lobbying our legislators and housing committees to fix our statewide just cause for eviction, which allowed a loophole for folks to be evicted just for saying like, hey, uh, I want to renovate this place. You have to go. You can come back, but the rent is going to be higher. So we were advocating this year to fix that. I've also just been working countywide as well with many labor groups and community-based organizations where we fought for the Contra Costa A3 program, also known as the Miles Hall Crisis Response Hub, named after the individual who was gunned down and killed by Walnut Creek Police when he was having a mental health crisis. And we also went ahead as part of the Racial Justice Coalition to advocate for funding to go to African American Wellness and Holistic Services. Currently there's $8.5 million put to the side for groups who are already serving the African American community. And there, and there is an $80,000 feasibility study that is happening to uh, see what a countywide hub would look like. And a lot of this is just me building relationships with many community-based organizations, our labor leaders, and community stakeholders who are all coming together to fight for improvements in the county wherever the issue is. All the issues that I mentioned, none of them have ever been beneficial for myself, but it is about honoring the integrity and needs of community members who are fighting for these services and resources and making sure I'm not only organizing with them so their voices are heard, but as I'm carrying their message, honoring the integrity of what they're saying without going into uh, tokenism or poverty dumping. Why well, should vote for me? Have anybody watched the city council? Huh? I've been fighting the city council, right? Last time I was there, like, last time I was there, I said, uh, uh, the captain went up to me, grabbed me, and said, you have no constitutional right to speak. Because the mayor does not believe in any constitutional rights. This is why you vote for me. He's standing next to the Palestinian flag sponsoring terrorism and hate and violence. You do not take a note to the Constitution and support a bunch of terrorists. They defunded the police. They got involved in telling the police not enforce the law. He had a bunch of criminals running around here going crazy. This is why Richmond was the most violent city in the state. Ever since McLaughlin had gone on city council, her and her RPA admitted that they're a, a Bernie Sanders government. You can't take an oath to the Constitution when you're supporting this. Their job is to obey the constitutional laws, to make you safe, to support law enforcement, and what does the RPA does? They totally destroy the whole, whole entire thing. Every time I want them to speak, oh, you don't have the right to speak. Well, what about the First Amendment? What about the Brown Act? You see, this is the kind of government we have. Ever since the RPA took office, Richmond has been a disaster. They try to destroy the real estate market with Tofa. Excuse me. And the one that try to imp their own type of laws. And this thing from Chevron now, from my own personal opinion, it's a hoax. Because there's no physical contract between both parties and saying that they're going to get this money from Chevron. Nothing. All they're saying is they did it for political reasons so they can get the vote. That's what they've been doing. And these people are so corrupt. This is why I've been fighting the city council for, for a number of years now. And right now you have three people running on the same ticket. 
This is what you call an anarchist. This, this is what you call a dictatorship. Because they're trying to do everything they can to keep the status quo on that city council. If you are not an RPA member, and if you get on the city council, you're, you're toast. Because you are not going to get the votes that you need. And you're not going to get nothing done. They're going to do what they want to do. Period. Now you need, from now on, watch the city council meetings and you'll see what's really going on because right now I'm only going to go up there. I'm not going to give them the business. I'm just going to speak the truth because I respect my constitutional laws. I respect my country and I'm not going to have a bunch of lawmakers on, uh, on the city council that sponsor terrorism, that stand up for hate. They even condemn Israel for defending themselves. How would you like the big bully came and attacked you? So the question was, why should you vote for me? I spent this campaign seasoning, uh, this campaign season, um, not telling folks to vote for me, but getting them registered because in District One we have such a low propensity voting threshold where. We have 20,000 residents, and not all are documented. However, we had 4,700 roughly the last District 1 election to cast ballots, and only about 2,500 actually participated. So when we say vote for me, vote for me, I really don't find any enthusiasm behind that. It's more so educating the public on this local political process, why there is such a huge importance that needs to surround local government and how um, the presidential election is monumental, especially this year. However, we need to know who is um, having the say in our daily lives, who um, is having a say when we need a speed bump in front of our house, who do we go to, and things of that nature. Um, I myself was an organizer once upon a time on the front line of seeing like every issue. However, I knew that that would limit me. So I had to move um, towards wanting to become a proactive leader and becoming a proactive leader. And that's someone that can actually, you know, put, put the advocacy into action. And it's one thing to fight for something or, or to go against the status quo but we must be proactive leaders. We must um, go against the status quo. We must break up the monotony that is going on in our current council. And I feel like I'm the woman for the job. So thank you. Thank you all. Um, for the second question, we'll start with Mr. Rosberg and Judge Dr. Brown and Council Member Willis. Uh, our reporters from the news organizations, they've been in District 1, they've been talking to people. And what they're hearing time and again is that people are very satisfied with the physical condition of the district, of the streets, um, that there is illegal dumping going on, there's trash, there's homelessness, and other quality of life issues seem to be at the forefront. So how would you address these things? Well, first of all, you need to get the RPA out of the city council. That's one thing. That's, that's a major problem. Now this right here, I took a picture of this homeless man here who's blocking the sidewalk. Every time I walk by there, you can smell urine and human waste. He's been there for three months and Richmond PD has did nothing. Because the RPA and city council told the police not to do anything. You're just going to have to convince the people not to do it. It's the people that's making the city dirty. Right? I mean, you got to have to like train these people, you know, put your uh, trash in the garbage. Or once you call the city up and have them come and pick it up. See, they don't have a program like that. People just go ahead and dump it out on the street. Because actually, in this district right here, you got a bunch of poor people. They can't afford to go to the dump, take a mattress to a dump, or load up the pickup truck and go to the city dump. So what do they do? They just throw it out on the street. Because where I live at, I see people dumping all the time. And uh, I'm just sitting there watching this guy pulled up with a whole truck, just threw, threw everything, took your mattresses out, chairs and tables. So I 
I called it in. The next day they came up and figured it out. But you have to convince the people not to trash the city. I mean, face it. The last 20 years, Central Richmond has been the most violent place here. I mean, there's a lot of poor people. I mean, it's not considered a, a well-to-do area. But there's some people that have good steady jobs, but most of the people are low income. And we know for a fact that Central is the most violent place in the whole, whole entire city. But it's all convincing the people to don't trash. Just, just make a phone call. See, this is, this is what the city's not doing. They're not having a program where they can call up the city and say, hey, come and pick up my mattress. See, they're not doing it. Because people don't want to waste their time loading stuff in the truck and take it to the dump. So, you know, there's, there's other ways that you can do it. Convince the people not to do that stuff. And, when we talk about District 1, or when we talk about Richmond, and you mentioned District 1, most people are not going to know what you're talking about right offhand. But when you mention downtown Richmond or central Richmond or Belgian Woods, that's typically the area that's known as the ghetto. So the interpretation that folks have is that this is an any and everything goes type neighborhood. And I feel that in order to get control of the trash and all of the concerns that were mentioned, um, is that create stricter um, property maintenance codes also finding those landlords and landowners who allow their properties to just go undealt with on a daily basis um, hold our city officials accountable for the many unused properties that are available in spaces to be activated um, for local organizations and things of that nature also prioritizing affordable housing so we could get some of the folks that are on the streets, off of the streets. Uh, 2023, they did a, um, the numbers were that there were about 630 some odd unhoused folks. Yet, we have about 430 surplus properties, which about 17 of them uh, qualify for affordable housing. So what does that tell us? That tells us that we need to get to building and that we need to get folks that are um, ready to push and ready to fight and cut out all of the who you don't take money from and all of the other type of uh, rhetoric that continues and do what's in the best interest of Richmond residents because that's my that's my vested interest. Once elected into office, it's gonna be Richmond first, Richmond residents first. So whatever that looks like, what's in the needs um, of the community. However, we know, and I know personally working in social work that we're not gonna make everyone happy but we can do what's right. And when, you're do and when you're doing what's right, everything else seems to just fall in place. So that's my contribution, thank you. Yeah, it's, yeah especially uh, beginning in 2020, that's when I noticed houselessness get worse, poverty got even worse to the point where folks are having yard sales every other week in places I've never even seen them. And um, also there was just, a, there was a lot of uh, recommendations that came from our city staff to actually cut services and lay off people. So what I felt like I've been doing when I got reelected in 2020 is just making sure that the services that we already had stay there to begin with because all those programs that take care of our roads and service our community, those folks were looking at layoffs and furloughs. So some of the steps that I did take while in office is I did pass a, led the effort to pass an eviction moratorium to prevent people from being evicted because it is easier to become homeless than it is to actually get back into housing. Uh, we also managed to get some money from the state where we brought services to the encampments that did pop up and start transitioning people out of those encampments. For the illegal dumping, we just last year started a block camera program and started putting up license plate readers and cameras in 
hot spot areas where dumping was happening. So if we're able to catch those folks who are doing the illegal dumping, we can actually go after them and hold them accountable to discourage them from doing illegal dumping again. Uh, we're in a better place where our budget is healthier than it was so we can start tackling our crumbling infrastructure needs because we've only been able to provide services most of the time and deal with some of our higher traffic areas of infrastructure but never do a full makeup like we've always been wanting and this has been an issue that's been going on even before I was on the council. One thing that we have done is we do have a community love your block block program where we can reach out to residents and community based organizations to actually get community members out and be part of a community cleanup day which I participated in many of those myself and they're always fun you just get to meet people and even folks who aren't necessarily involved are happy that community members just showed up to care because they do feel abandoned or they can't whatever's going on in our lives they just haven't seen that type of investment in community and we're, we're all coming together to actually love our block it does make the biggest difference and um yeah the other thing that's not going to need to happen which i'm encouraging every richmond resident to do and especially district one is now that we have this 550 million dollars over the next 10 years we have community budget hearings and we need to make sure that community members especially out here where the needs are are showing up and saying what we need at the council thank you for the next question we'll go brown willis foster um, it's no surprise to any of you that the average income in district one is around seventy two thousand dollars a year and that about 35% of the people who live in your district are earning less than $50,000 a year. Some of the residents that we spoke to are so focused on just getting by that they don't get involved in the political process at all. Um, how, what would you do to reach out to these constituents and to um, hear their concerns? Thank you. Yeah, th there are so many ways that we can move into a more modernized um, way of reaching our constituents. We know that our um, our younger folks are on social media, so making sure that we have someone that's matching their energy on social media and being able to um, to cross over that information. When you go to city council meetings and things like that, you probably come across like maybe a 96 pager. And it's like, mm, the odds of them actually reading it through, probably less than likely. However, if we had someone breaking down those really dense documents down to the public to where they can understand, um, I think they'll feel like that's transparent. Also, being able to make city council meetings accessible for everyone. We have working parents and um, folks that are just getting off work, so the likelihood of staying at a council meeting to 1.30 a.m. is not really, you know, the best thing if we want to engage folks in this political uh, process. Um, also, just encouraging folks to attend their neighborhood council meetings. So that's a step down, and it's, it's, um, it's about um, once a month, so which is really doable. And they only have you in there for about an hour, hour and a half, and they have food and snacks and, and everything like that. So that's pretty encouraging for folks to get out. But communicating with your neighborhood council meetings, um, you're able to see other um, community members, other neighbors where you can collectively voice your opinions and you know they'll take that and escalate uh, your concerns up. And just also, just being transparent, being a council member who's visible in their community and not just during election time. Because so often during election time, we have council members and candidates that are flooding our communities with these elevated promises. And then afterwards, we don't see them anymore. So again, being visible in your community, attending events, and just, it, community engagement looks like a lot of things. So just, you know, just starting somewhere and getting engaged with your community. And that's why that's what I love so much about this district election is that you're able to hone in 
on your on your um, neighborhood and interact more frequently with your constituents. So I think just starting there in your district, being very, very solid in your district, and then eventually expanding out, because although we do, um, although we will run um, or oversee the District 1, we are city council members of the entire city of Richmond. But again, starting small and branching out. Can you repeat the question? Yes, um, there was a request to repeat the question. We spoke to residents in the district who were so focused on getting by that they don't get involved at all with the political process. So how would you reach out to those people to bring them in and to um, hear their concerns? So it's Mr. Willis and, and, and you, Mr. Wasserberg. Oh yeah, no, um, if it wasn't for ACE, I don't know if I would have been participating in my own city government because, yeah, no, I understand that getting by, living check to check, hoping to make it, make it to the next paycheck so you can do grocery shopping and take care of all the other necessities, so I am grateful that I do have a job that allows me to be organized and pays me to be in the community so I can actually have been able to build up the skills to really do those that community engagement. Usually what I do, especially when I do hear about an issue, if people can't make it to a council meeting, I'll come straight to them and do a site visit and just say, okay, what is the issue? How long has it been happening? Where is it happening at? What is the solution that you need? And sometimes the solution is simple. It's, I will, get people connected to our staff and department heads at the city and schedule one-on-ones or if it's necessary schedule group meetings with other neighbors to you know really paint a picture of what those issues are a couple of examples of that was at the beginning of this year at one of our very very low income uh, residents at the st john's apartments uh, yeah, I, that was an angry week for me because a bunch of people got 10-day pay-or-quit notices anywhere between $3,000 to $14,000. Please pay that to me in 10 days or get out. Freaking out a bunch of people and within a half an hour, I was with the rent program director and a bunch of residents standing outside of the St. John's getting them connected to those services, scheduling counseling appointments, and then also engaging with the property managers to let them know what they did wrong and a proper way to go about that. Also around the corner from where I live, there were some lights that were actually hooked up to light up the Wendell Park area, but nobody ever turned on the switch. And it took residents actually coming out and raising the issue and we figured out that, yeah, they had a work order for it, but the person who worked for PG&E didn't work there anymore, so it just got lost in the shuffle. Same thing with some of the speed bumps that needed to go up. We had transitions in our public works department, so a lot of those issues got launched in the shuffle. So doing that re-engagement and status check and making sure that residents have that constant communication, know exactly who to talk to, and I also, uh, we'll tell them, like, if you can't do it yourself, add me to the email, then I'll try to bolster, move that thing forward. And also, speaking out of public comment, uh, we still have Zoom so people can call in from home, take their two minutes at public comment, and I will organize community members to tie up our Zoom line if need be. I think the question was more uh, financial needs. Well, it's your own fault for not going to college and getting an education. Right? You think you're just going to get out of high school and start working? You know, they call it a, a job skill, a trade. Once you have that, you can make good money. I worked at Chevron. I made $1,400 a week working as a mechanic. I worked in the auto trade, automotive trade. I was making good money. But see, people go to the city council, they cry, well, I ain't got no money, I ain't got no this. Well, it's their own fault. You, you need to better your life. There's opportunities out there, but the only problem is, now, now Richmond is taxing the Hades out of Chevron. They're taxing the Hades out of all these big businesses. They're not moving in. They're moving out. No business is going to come here to Richmond. Why do you think people are going to end up poor? Then they go to the 
the city council, they think the city council has a magic wand that they're going to help them with their uh, financial needs. How many people in this room have a skill in the trade? Huh? How many people went to two four-year college? You make, some of you make pretty good money, right? But you can't count on the government, the city council, to take care of you. The job of the city council is to make sure the streets are safe, the, uh, the streets are in good condition, you got lighting, under, they have laws to protect you people. You got to make sure the sidewalks are safe. You don't have squatters living on homeless cabins almost every street corner, like the uh, RPAs doing the city council. They did more for these squatters on right of road than they did for anybody else. They had a catering service. They gave them breakfast and bed at Tiffany's. See, this is what they're doing. So you don't people see you people don't realize what what the Richmond City. Council is doing. But it's up to you to better your lives. Don't realize that somebody else is going to hand you a plate. You need to go out and earn it yourself. In some cases, yeah, you know, you might need some help. Because I know, I was homeless for 16 years. I lived in my truck for 16 years. I know what it is to dig in garbage cans to make work for $5 an hour and uh, make uh, work for $15, $20 an hour. It's all of the person on what they want to do with their lives. And, you know, I mean, I go to the city council and they said, oh, man, please help us with this, please help us with that. They always got to blame, blame the landlords. You know, people live in these, uh, down on St. John's, the projects and stuff like that. They could get a better life. They could go to school, get a trade, and then they could move out. But they don't want to do it. Some of them would rather live in the ghetto and be poor. This one person told me it's, it's easy to be poor than have to go out and hustle through life, so I'm just going to kick back and clip my welfare and have the government take care of me. I don't buy that at all. Thank you. Thank you. This will be the last question before we go to the audience. And the order will be Willis Fosberg Brown. Um, you've all mentioned lack of affordable housing. This is not just a District 1 or even just a Richmond problem. Uh, one senior that we talked to was saying that to afford her apartment, she needed three roommates. So what would you offer as solutions? Yeah, specific reasons why that is why I ended up organizing the past rent control and just cause for eviction, which can only go so far because those only cover units that are multifamily units built before 1995. Uh, in terms of like more housing development, the thing that I would prioritize and always prioritize since I've been on the council is just mixed income developments that have deep, deep affordable housing components in it and making sure that, you know, I know there's requirements in terms of how you have to advertise out lists, but making sure that Richmond community members are first because we have overcrowding and households in general because the housing market is so extraordinarily expensive. And also, frankly, what needs to happen is, I know there's a, how many folks seen those vote no on 33 commercials? Please vote yes on 33. That repeals Costa Hawkins, and if we repeal Costa Hawkins, cities like Richmond's rent control will expand to single families homes, will expand to buildings that were built after 1995. We could actually look at policies like vacancy control, but right now we're only able to maintain like the affordable housing components for people who are actually living in their units. After that, I have talked to landlords who look at their building as an investment. Now I'm not going to judge. That is a personal choice, but that's part of the reason why this year I've been advocating for there to be a statewide constitution to make housing a constitutional right in California, and also statewide there's many groups that are organizing towards the Million Homes campaign to hold Gavin Newsom accountable for his, uh, or any governor frankly, for their plan to build a million homes by 2030. We need, and the things that I've also have done is I've supported efforts for like community land trusts locally with some of our ARPA money and also countywide with the Measure X Fund 
participated in those Board of Supervisors meetings, so there's actually now a housing trust fund that has $12 million every single year dedicated to that, which goes to rental assistance, tenant legal services, and even filling in gap funding for affordable housing projects that haven't been available. And yeah, um, our surplus land also sending out requests for call qualifications and requests for proposals for folks that are going to focus on deep, deep affordable housing components that are not just matching, you know, they use this uh, area regional income base to base what affordable housing is and we don't need to be compared to places like Danville, Oakland and other cities that are more expensive to us. We need to focus on our regional income measures based on Richmond's income. I would see uh, rent control, but you, you need to be careful. You don't want to destroy the real estate market. You destroy the real estate market, you put every person here in Richmond on rent control, you're destroying the real estate market, and the rich, Richmond credit is going to go down. It's, Richmond is done. Remember Topa? See, none of you people don't know about Topa. It was a scam by the city council to evaluate people's property so poor people could buy it. See, this is the scammers that they got on, on the city council. I live in public housing because I'm retired. Disability, Social Security. My rent's a little bit high, but, but still I can afford it. But like I say, it all depends, because actually what you're doing, you're paying for the area. Because you got, really, Richmond is prime real estate. So if you could, uh, years ago in the Iron Triangle down on 4th McDonald, you could buy a three-bedroom house for $100,000. And it was the most deadliest place in the state of California. Real estate, man, it was, it was great. But as soon as crime started dropping down, the real estate started going up. But it all goes back to square one. How are you going to live your life? What plans you have on your life? You go to school, you get an education, you get a job skill. You won't have to bother you. You won't have to go through this stuff. But you know, it's uh, you need to do your research on Topa, and then the savings and loan scam that the city tried to do. Just sign your property over to us; we'll take care of it. All it was a scam because the city was going to sell the property to the real estate and give the people nothing. But like I say, you know, you have to have some type of rent control. There's people that really can't go out and get a good steady job. They work at low-income jobs, and they need a place to live too. So that's why I favor some, some rent control. But like I say, for you young kids out there, you better get into college and start learning to trade. Because those days are over when you get out of high school and start working at a factory or anywhere else. Those days are over. It's gone. Because the job market is real hard nowadays. All right? Because everybody wants to blame everybody else for their screw-ups. Right? I remember. I met my, uh, two years after high school, I met my math teacher. She asked, what are you doing? I said, I'm working in the factory. I was all dirty and stuff. She said, I told you to do your homework, didn't I? I said, I said yeah, you're right. And this is what I try to tell these kids. But like I say, Richmond, you pay for the weather. You have no hurricanes, you have tornadoes, you have no floods. We might have a rainstorm from here from time to time. I lived in this barrier all my life. I know what by art. When I was working, I had no problem paying rent because I was making good money. I was, when I used to work out as an auto mechanic, I was making $1,000 a day on the side. Thank you. Can you repeat the question, please? Sure. Thank you. We, the question is about affordable housing. Okay. I can just go from there. <laughs> How do I want you to ask it, it, it's just basically, what would your solutions be? Okay, great. Um, so even therapeutic-wise, I'm very solution-based. So we can hear about a lot of things, but it's like, well, what are we going to do about it? And so I feel like Richmond, especially with District 1, uh, seem to be on a good track when it comes to building affordable housing. We just got the Hacienda uh, Heights up with about 150 affordable housing units. Um, Metro Walk Phase 2 is um, in the works as well with about uh, an additional 150 units. We have the, uh, the Motel 6 conversion, which will be about 48 units, um, supportive 
um, supportive services uh, living, so permanent housing, which will be great. Um, also, in District 1, we have a very unique space that, that I feel has been solid, and I've been asking the question, like, so what's going on? What's going on here? What's going on here? 12th and McDonald. If you were to just, like, we could literally take a field trip and walk there, there's these enormous vacant lots that have just been sitting there. I'm 37, and they've been sitting there for at least like two decades unused. That's the type of solutions that we need. We need builders, we need proactive leadership. People that are gonna see these type of vacant properties, and I mean these type of vacant areas, just land just sitting there, and ask the question. We have people that are literally, so these two lots that I'm referring to are gated, and we literally have the unhoused population sleeping on the ground outside of those gated lots. That is so unfair, and it's unfair to other community members that have to go by and, and watch this all take place. So again, to your question, we have a lot in the works, but can we do more? And the answer is yes, we can do more. We can build more housing. We have enough infrastructure currently present. All we need is the right people on council to get it done. Thank you. So now it's time for the audience's questions. And the order, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, is Wolby, Wasper, Brown, and Willis, if the question is to everyone. But you could also ask individuals. Um, if you have a question, just raise your hand and we'll run a mic over to you. If you, if you wrote your question on a card and you would prefer that we read it, just hold your card up and someone will come and get it. We ask that you just keep your questions succinct and to the point, and to please start by saying your name. Hi. Uh, my name is Diana Ware and I serve on the Economic Development Commission here in Richmond and we're really excited that we're just about to launch the Taste of Richmond to lift up the restaurants here in our city. We got a wonderful grant from the City Council to help uh, support the restaurants because many have not recovered from the pandemic. So my question for each of you is how do you see work that you can do or a vision for uplifting the small businesses, particularly restaurants but others? And we're going to be highlighting Phila Burger um, yeah. right here in District 1. Um, but what, what do you envision as a way to uplift small businesses, in particular restaurants? Well, my own personal opinion, the Richmond City Council has no business getting in other people's business if they want to start a business. If you want to start a business, you go down and get a loan, that's how you start a business. But I'm sure, you know, my own personal opinion, I wouldn't even have the city get involved with this stuff. Because what they're doing is, they want to start all these small businesses. I like the question, what areas are you talking about? in Richmond. Are you talking about here in downtown Richmond that you're going to open up a restaurant here? It ain't going to happen here. It'll only last five minutes because you got a high crime rate probably out, out the outskirts, but, but knowing what the city council is going to do, they want to start all these small businesses and they want to get rid of the big businesses. It don't make sense because they think all these small businesses are going to bring in more revenue and put people to work. It doesn't happen. I know how the RP is going to operate on these small businesses. To my own person's opinion, ain't nothing but a scam. That's what they're doing. See, you people don't really know what the RP is doing. They try to act like they're real nice people, but they got another trick up their sleeve. Believe me, I've been fighting these people for a long time. I know how they operate. But like I say, it's not for the city government to go down 
and give people loans to open up a business. If I were to open up a business, I'll have to get a loan, get my business license, everything, and have something that people want. If I go out of business, okay, so be it. I shouldn't have to run to the city council and have to bail me out. Because we all know how the RPA works. Because actually, you just get more government, more government, and more government. And it shouldn't be like that. Like I said, you go out of business, that's your problem. Supporting uh, local businesses in particular, I think will be beneficial for the city to offer some tax incentives. Um, but first and foremost, safety, especially when we're talking about downtown District 1. Across all professions, safety is number one. I've never known a profession where safety isn't uh, the chief, the, the head of everything. So we have to get our safety and, and things of that nature under control so people would want to come here and start their business. So people would want to expand their business and not rush and leave. Um, earlier, um, Mark spoke about um, taxing. You know, whenever Richmond seems to need money, they seem to create a new tax, which is really weird. Instead of creating new business revenue, that looks like supporting <coughs> entrepreneurship, whether that's small business, medium-sized businesses, or large businesses. Um, giving those, again, giving those tax incentives and um, business tax credits and, and things of that nature, making it more appealing. Of course, we have a lot of things to do before we start popping up more businesses around here. We have to clean up the streets. Like, there's times where family come in from out of town, like, I don't want to take my family to Panola. Um, to sit down outside and have ice cream because it looks nice and it's aesthetically pleasing. I don't want to have to go to El Cerrito. I want to stay right here in Richmond because I love Richmond. Richmond is a beautiful place and we have so much, so much untapped potential. And we just need to really start pushing a line. We really need the service providers to start providing the services. We can't expect so much from the community if we're not holding that same fire to our local representatives. Yeah, the last year, whenever the city was discussing what to do with the rest of our ARPA funding, and I'll just say shout outs to COBIS and Richmond Main Street. I don't know if it's exactly what y'all wanted, but we did allocate one point one, two million dollars towards a uh, small business relief and recovery from those who have been impacted by COVID-19. I think also what needs to be done in general is uh, evaluating our planning process to make sure that it's not discouraging any new business owners from going through that process and seeing how we're streamlining it and making it more user friendly as much as possible. I was uh, supportive and voted to put Measure U on a ballot, which passed with about 70% of the vote back in 2020, and that lowered the business license to $100 for anybody who made $250,000 in gross receipts or less. The business license would be $100. And one thing that I appreciated, and honestly, thank you for the question, we need to operationalize this, and if I'm elected, I'll be committed to this, but we need to do more of a check-in and annual needs assessment of a lot of our businesses just to see and understand like what some of those challenges are and actually hear from them what they're dealing with and figure out how we're using and leveraging our resources to support them as much as possible. And, the, and also, you know, reaching out about this uh, funds that are set along to the side to help out small businesses that still need to recover from COVID-19 and making sure we're putting very specific criteria on that as well so the money goes exactly where it needs to go to. The other thing that I was very, that I supported and uh, co-sponsored with Council Member, now Vice Mayor Jimenez, and Council Member Cepeda is creating an arts corridor which is actually going to be coming down this part of downtown Richmond. Uh, 
and also along 23rd Street. And my hope and vision for that arts corridor is that it brings an identity to the corridor that makes it attractive so people want to come and see what's happening with our small businesses. And there's a new executive director of Richmond Main Street named Sarah that I just talked to, and she had a wonderful idea that I was just absolutely like, yeah, no, it sounds so simple, but we should do it. Actually start creating that vision for what is going to be coming to Richmond in some of these vacant lots. Like 12th and McDonald, there's still negotiations that are happening on a background that I wish I could get into, but I can't. But you know, even just putting up a sign saying, hey, this is gonna be coming to Richmond, or hey, <coughs> this vacant building, this is what you're gonna see coming there now. So people aren't just seeing a vacant building, they're seeing what's to come in the future and can actually get excited about it. Um, my name is Sky Lamana, and I'm a reporter for Richmond Confidential. So my question is specifically for Dr. Brown. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So on your platform website, you talk. Okay. Can you hear me? Oh, perfect. Sorry, y'all. Um, so on your platform website, you talk about having a plan to engage the Richmond community through community action committees. And so what does the format of these committees look like and what does the leadership role or what are the leadership roles that community members will be able to take? Thank you so much, great question. Um, when we're talking about community engagement, we're talking about um, activating community members to engage in activities probably that they wouldn't ordinarily engage in. Also, um, more specific to your question is the half a billion dollar settlement that we just received from Chevron. So having an oversight committee, as well as having an advisory board. This half a billion dollars, uh, 50, 50 million a year, will be coming into the general fund. The general fund has the, the city has the opportunity to spend that general fund however they see fit. So having an oversight committee and an advisory board made up of community members and people that are you know directly impacted would give us that opportunity to engage the community like hey where do you want to see this money placed you know having a comprehensive assessment of our city of our district specifically identifying the immediate needs in the community and using some of those funds if not all to address the needs that are going on in our community and not because and I say that because we, I've heard so many different responses from various council members about what they're going to do with this funding and I'm like well it's going in the general fund so that's really not a guarantee so we need something more concrete and that's why having an, um, an oversight committee and an advisory board would give us something concrete and tangible that we can actually know where this money will be bundled to instead of just going into the general fund and paying bills. You know, so I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown. We have a question, some questions on cards and if you, you have a question, just put your card in the air, you could even have it in Spanish. Um, so this one is for Council Member Willis. About two years ago, the council majority chose to focus on education programs in lieu of enforcement to combat sideshows. The question is, what is the status of those programs? The community education to combat sides, uh, side, <laughs> side shows. I, the last report that I remember getting from it from two years ago came from Paul Graves, who was the assistant district attorney working out of the police department. And one thing that they do is they are the DA's office has a diversion program, so if they happen to catch somebody who was a part of a sideshow, they'll do a diversion program as opposed to doing incarceration. 
Uh, and that and that's where and that's the part of the implementation on the communication that I'm very much aware of is that diversion program but that's only if they're able to catch somebody on top of just letting community members know like hey don't participate in any sideshows that are happening in the community do not promote any sideshows that you know are happening in the community as well and on top of that since we've had that conversation two years ago we actually implemented some of the recommendations that came out of that presentation and that means we have CCTV cameras that are posted up in a lot of the hotspot areas going back to the flock uh, camera program uh, that and contracting with a license plate reader but that data stays within the city of Richmond Police Department it doesn't get shared out to any other agency unless they catch somebody who is involved in reckless driving the city of Richmond has a policy to not do high-speed pursuits within the city for safety issues so having that data is able to be able to share uh, across <coughs> other jurisdictions so if they do catch somebody who leaves the city in a high-speed chase and the and that license plate gets flagged in like another jurisdiction like Oakland, Vallejo or wherever we're sharing uh, the services with they're able to flag it and move forward if they filed something for reckless driving. And on top of that, uh, for other hotspot areas, because some of the sideshows are very isolated and will happen like that, maybe one individual or two individuals, working with community members and walking them through our traffic safety process in order to figure out how we're deterring sideshows from happening in hotspot areas as well. And honestly, we could do more to do community education and just be more intentional about all these things that are happening because even for me, I had to look up the presentation we had two years ago because we're looking at a million agenda items per minute, so we're always having to shift our brains to the next issue. But the CCTV program and license plate readers are up and along with traffic safety guidelines and diversion programs for those that we catch involved in sideshows. More questions? our community members have been experiencing for some time with the 
you know, the excess bike lanes when our seniors are, are um, having extreme concerns about not being able to get on and off the curbs what they feel safely. Um, the millions that we're putting into the electric bikes that are in front of the Nevin Center, if you will, in District 1, and now they're no longer there because they've been stolen and things like that. We don't really have a bike, you know, a huge bike culture. And when we have a mom that has four kids that has to get to work, um, school, pick up groceries, do laundry, um, I think she'll need something bigger than an electric bike. <laughs> And I'm going to plus one Dr. Brown's community oversight body. That's something that actually came up when we had our special meeting at the Richmond City Council August 14th. And I know that's something I've definitely been committed to. I heard three council members that during that meeting say that in their statements that they wanted to sponsor bringing a community oversight body forward. And I was like, great, cool. I can't wait to vote yes on it whenever we get all the details. Uh, figured out. And on top of that, even right now during the campaign, like as I'm talking to people, I'm letting them know about that $550 million and letting them know how to sign up on during public comment and make sure that we're getting a good needs assessment in the community on what are those things that have been neglected for years so we can make sure that we are prioritizing it. And, you know, making sure that we're being responsible with this money and not getting so happy like we hit the lottery so we just blow it all in one sitting. We've already had people try reaching out to various council members saying, hey, we need you to put 30 million towards this issue or this million and that. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's have our community budget sessions first. Let's get as much input as possible and also Blast that more, just letting people know that for the next 10 years, we're going to be getting 50 million a year for five years, and then the final year, 60 million a year. Here are the opportunities you can to participate, and if community members can't make it to our budget hearing sessions or city council meetings to do it, then we bring those issues to them. We work with the local community based organizations, local community groups and just find centralized areas where everybody feels safe enough to come out and give their input and vision on how they want this money to be spent. This money with Chevron is all just to get by votes. The lunch time, this is what they're gonna do. That half a billion dollars is gonna go straight to the general fund, straight up to Sacramento. Don't let the city council fool you and tell you that it's going to go straight to Richmond. It doesn't happen like that. Every tax you pay goes up to the state, and it's going to go straight into the general fund. When I see a written contract between Chevron and the city about that money, then I'll believe it. Right now, for me, it's all just a bunch of hearsay. We're going to do this, and we're going to do that. If Chevron, all I know is it was a verbal promise. It wasn't a contract signed by both parties by both lawyers. As far as I'm concerned, they're just make, they're just blowing everything up to make everything look good. Because once I see Chevron gets on the airwaves and says, here's a check, and they show us the contract, because all it is is a verbal agreement. That even that's not even going to hold up the court. Because Chevron has the best lawyers in the world and they'll find a way to get out of it. They had to sue over Measure U because the taxes were so high. So like I say, don't count, don't count the chickens before it's hatched because I because uh, something ain't right. So like I said, when I see that contract signed by both parties, then I'll know it's a true deal. But for right now, they're making a big thing out of it. Oh look, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. It's all about getting votes. It's what people do. So like I can say, don't trust the word that the RP is telling you. You need to sit and wait, and when you go to that city council meeting, you tell them, I want to see the written contract. Because like I say, a formal contract won't hold no weight in court at all. The sheriff's not stupid, they'll find a way to get out of it. 
Okay, thank you all. We're going to go to the cards now, and the this is for all three. The order will be Willis, Wasberg, Brown. Um, all, all three candidates touched on the city's crime rate. Recently, the Richmond Community Police Review Commission's top investigator resigned due to the board ignoring evidence of police misconduct. What do you plan to do to hold the accused officers and Richmond Community Police Review Commission accountable? Evaluating the Richmond Community uh, Police com uh, Commission and also assuring that it's actually keeping up with the best practices of other review commissions across the county. There's actually been a, the last time that commission was updated, unfortunately, was after Petty Perez was killed. And since then, states, the state has actually passed laws that allow community vote review commissions to have more authority and that also means even having subpoena power as well and up until recently I thought that if anybody got had bodily harm that would automatically trigger a review in the community police commission and I found out that there are more specific circumstances that need to happen before that before an automatic review should happen. So yeah, on top of that, it's just going to be making sure that the guidelines of the Community Police Review Commission triggers whenever uh, triggers whenever there's bodily harm that's happening in the community, and actually just publicizing more that the Community Review Commission is a place you can go if you have any issues with officers dealing with misconduct issues. I mean, I already had to work with a community member in District 1 who had a negative experience with the police officers, and he didn't even know about the CPRC. He just reached out to me, his district council member, and invited me to be a part of a meeting he was having at the police department in order to address some of these issues. And that's some of the things that I've been having to do is if folks have issues with the cops, I've been the one fielding the complaints trying to schedule meetings with the police chief and the assistant police chief and see if community members are willing to speak up. But we just need to automate that commission a bit more when it comes to misconduct issues and make it more simplified for folks who want to file a grievance. Well, I went to the police commission meeting. They don't have no power. All they do is get it fill out a report, have their meetings, and they hand it over to the chief. I was attacked at the city council meeting. The cop came up and told me, that's enough, you said enough, he put his hands on me, and says, you don't have the right to speak. That was right on video. I said, right now we have three corrupt cops. The chief has a restraining order on her. She was out there threatening people's lives because her daughter was out there being a uh, prostitute, she went after uh, the prostitute's family, threatened them, that's why they had a restraining on her. Captain Simmons, he attacked me, and that one cop, I think his name's uh, Sergeant Kane, he attacked uh, Cowboy Gus. The Richmond Police Department is notorious about corrupt cops. Back in the day, you had the Cowboys. None of you people remember that because you were just too young then. And uh, <laughs> believe me, see, we have to get the corrupt cops out. It, this is not bashing the police. This is not defunding the police. It's all about getting the corrupt cop. You cannot be a police officer and go out there being a thug. Because I jumped all over the police, the police chief last meeting. I had no problem with the Richmond PD until I got in a conflict with Tim Simmons. This guy was just acting like a thug. And I lost all respect for it. But like I say, you can't, just because you got three bad cops, you can't say all cops are bad. But like I say, Mark Daniel, I went to court, Mark Daniel Light, it cost me $400. We need cops, but don't trust them. Believe me, it's true. I had my feelings with cops. I don't trust them at all. And I, yeah, you guys know what I mean. But like I say, it, it's, it's, uh, they should have, okay, thank you. Yes, so 
The community review commissions, I felt that they should hold transparency with the public, ensuring that all policies and procedures are followed accordingly. Also, um, putting it back into the hands of our local department for them ensuring the transparency with the public. We shouldn't have to keep fishing for answers or um, trying to demand this or demand that. Um, the quickest way to isolate the community is to keep telling them, well, it's still under the, it's still under investigation, it's still pending. That's the fastest way to isolate the community as well as to lose trust. And so reinstilling that trust into our law enforcement agency, I think will be paramount to this process. And also engaging our community members, again, we have a police <coughs> department that is, you know, checks and balances, everything doesn't always add up. However, I just noticed, especially in District 1, the disrespect for our law enforcement uh, department and law enforcement overall, even across the nation, how the, pro the profession itself has been so degraded. And rightfully so, as mentioned, we may have a, a, a officer who's tainted and that could potentially taint the whole law enforcement uh, department. However, we have to publicly ridicule bad cops in the face of community members so we can know that, okay, our police department does not tolerate bad cops. And so with that, we're rebuilding trust and regaining the confidence of the community back into our law enforcement department. But also we have to train, uh, retrain this culture to start respecting law enforcement officers as well. Can we ask one more question, Becky, from um, some a resident? Here's one question here. So this question is for uh, Ms. Dr. Brown and uh, Council, Council Member Willis. So uh, everyone talks about the economics of downtown Richmond as, uh, in terms of uh, this area, as not having much to offer. But I know for facts that many people travel from this area to El Cerrito, to Pano, to do the grocery shopping. They travel to Oakland and Berkeley to go to restaurants. They are looking for services that they can, like you said earlier, um, allow their families to enjoy. So I'm wondering, since there is a demand for those particular services and experiences, what is your economic development plan for this area? Because there are great institutions and resources right here in this district, and we can't have the other council members ignoring the value that's here. And so I just want to get your thoughts in that regard. And lastly, we also want to know how will you support this community to have the water turned on so the trees can grow, to have the streets power washed so that the aesthetics of the space can look beautiful, to have the areas, um, to have them, the grass cut so when people park their cars, they can feel that the place is actually well cut. How can you support the institutions and the businesses and the schools and the people here operating? to have those quality services as well. Thank you. So the question was to Council Member Willis and then Dr. Ross. A lot of it is gonna just have to come down to marketing and also challenging the narrative that is out there in the community or in the greater region that Richmond is a crime written community and don't go there. Like the more that that narrative has been plaguing this city since before I've been on the council and we've actually come a very long way. Also just what is the community's vision for downtown Richmond? Like I can point out a vacant building and point out a business but it's also going to be like what kind of business do we actually want to go there and how are we identifying and marketing out to the business community saying like hey this is what our community wants to see let's work with you once again the for a small business especially opening up it's only a hundred dollars to have a business license which to me is an incentive to actually open up a business when before I've talked to community members who wanted to do business where they lived and worked and had their experiences in here in Richmond but they were discouraged by going through the process. And in terms of all those other needs that were mentioned, power washing, trimming the grass, a lot of that will also be coming down to what type of staff and services that we are gonna be hiring, 
making sure that if I'm elected as a council member, <coughs> I'm regularly available to meet with community members and identify those specific needs so they can be presented at council, ensuring that those needs are a part of our annual budget discussions until they're actually met. In terms of like our uh, street sweepers, and those, if the thing was power washing, we just had to replace a couple of street sweepers so we could start doing that again. And, you know, our meetings need to be clean on Pennsylvania Avenue. Apparently they weren't taken care of for three years. I went down there my damn self and started mowing down some meetings. So even just doing things like that, bringing attention to the issue. So when we're, when we're talking about District 1 and we're talking about it being safe, and I back the question, who is it safe for? There's still, born and raised in this area, fourth generation, there are still stop signs and stop lights that I don't sit at for too long. I'm just gonna, I'll rather get the ticket. Um, and that should speak to the safety here in this district. Also, um, our city council creates this safety or or says that our city is more safe because the reduced number of homicides in this area. Although the homicide rates have decreased, other crimes have increased, as well as Richmond residents, if you know people from Richmond, although they didn't get killed or die in Richmond, they may have died in Vallejo, they may have died in Antioch, they may have died in Oakland, so forth and so on. But um, when we're talking about how do we help support these places um, coming in, um, I'll speak back to that Chevron settlement that we just received. And it shouldn't be the city's payday, it should be the residents' payday because we are the ones that are directly impacted. Also, when we're talking about what are the needs in the community and what do we want to see, those are the things that, those are the things, um, that we need to discuss and why it's so important that we do get that oversight committee and that advisory board so community members can come out and say, hey, I live in District 1 or I live in District um, 2, 3, whatever, and say this is what I want to see in my community. And, and have that honored, have their voices actually heard. And also, when it comes to cleaning up our city and things like that, again, this money is not the city's payday, it's the community's payday. And we want to see cleaner streets, so we have to beef up our public services. I've spoken to public, work, uh, public works, and they are overworked and understaffed. That's why the lawns are overgrown. That's why the weeds are so high up to your waist. That's why you can't see, um, you know, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Um, we're at the part of the forum where each of the candidates is gonna get one minute to make a closing statement. We're gonna start with Mr. Wasberg, then go to Dr. Brown, and we'll end with our incumbent, Council Member Willis. One minute, huh? Okay. <laughs> I'll try to put everything in one minute. The bottom line of, of government is to serve the people under the Constitution. I don't care if the city council paints the streets gold. When you take a note to the Constitution, you respect it. You don't go around being stupid like this, supporting criminals. That's the place in terrorists, killing, burning babies. You don't be on the city council, stop and place checkpoints, and think you got some uh, rule that you're going to stop the federal government coming in and arresting criminals. That ain't going to happen. See, this is the stupidity that pe these people have on the city council. They think they have more power than the federal government. It doesn't work like that. The bottom line is we need to get the people off this city council. There's three people running on the same ticket because they want to ensure that their so-called communist regime stays on this city council. They've been doing this for almost 15 years now. You laugh, you think it's funny. You talk to the people around here. They know what's happening. You try to go in front of the city council to speak your piece, they will cut you down violating the Brown Act and the, the Constitution. So you can't have people like Willis and the RPA out there supporting criminals, supporting the hate, I, like I said, I don't care if they treat this gold. Get them out. Thank you. Thank you. District 1, I am the woman for the job. It's time to dispel the notion that our district is just the ghetto, where anything goes. 
We are so much more than that and we deserve better. Let's take back our streets and restore the pride and potential that has been overlooked for far too long. From day one, I will be ready to work. Equipped with the skills and expertise and heart that this district has been missing for far too long. I am not just talking about change. I'm here to make it happen. And on November 5th, Jamila Brown will appear on your ballot in District 1. And I ask for your support because District 1 deserves better. Thank you. All right, thank you again for hosting at this, e this event this evening. I've been on the council for two terms, and at the end of the day, there's already a lot that I can be proud of that I thought wasn't gonna happen. I mean, the Hacienda got rebuilt finally while I was on the council, when that got closed down in 2013 and became a place where folks broke into and even a bunch of fire hazards happened. When I first got elected, the city manager at the time was not that enthusiastic or hopeful about the library being renovated, and we had some dedicated staff and good decisions happen to where the library renovation project will break ground next year, and part of the Chevron money can help fill in any gap funding or even expand on the vision of what that library could be. We have community crisis response that wasn't out here in Richmond until I was happy enough to vote for when we had the opportunity and so many other issues. I'm proud of the work that I've done in Richmond, but at the end of the day, your vote is your own. Vote your conscience. Thank you very much, candidates. Thanks to all of you as well. I really apologize we didn't get to seven of your questions. <laughs> but thank you for being so Who wants engaged. to go till midnight? Anyone? Yeah. Anyone? <laughs> Council Not a council meeting. We have information back there, and if, if you enjoyed yourself tonight, you may want to check out our other two candidate forums uh, for District 6 on Monday, September 30th at the Bermuda Room in Memorial Auditorium, and for District 5 on Tuesday, October 8th at Eastern Hill United Methodist Church on Cutting Boulevard. You'll find more Competing information in Richmond Side no. and in uh, Richmond Confidential and CC Pulse and in the Old Team Thank you all.